Welcome to worship from beautiful Savior Lutheran in Waukesha, Wisconsin. I'm Peter Schmidt. I have the great privilege of serving as pastor here at Beautiful Savior. And I'm with our good friend Barnabas because, well, the day on which I am recording this is Friday, June 24th. You know what June 24th was? National Take Your Dog to Work Day. And so it's most appropriate that our church dog Barnabas is here with us today. We're going to hear in our message about a man named Barnabas. We're also going to hear about two people, Ananias and Sapphira. And we're going to hear a contrast between making good decisions and bad decisions. We're going to hear then family story readings. Our first reading from Proverbs today, all about wisdom. How God invites us to come to him for wisdom. And then we are going to hear in 1 John 3, again, how we live in wisdom. How we live in love. And what that means is not just talking the talk, but also walking the walk. And then Jesus gives us a story about people who are not wise, who refuse an invitation from the king, instead making up excuses so they don't have to come where he would have them be. We pray that the Lord doesn't find us as people who make excuses not to spend time with him, but rather he finds us as people who wish to worship with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, living up to the name he's given us, a name given to us in baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, our worship begins. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise unto him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. The deep places of the earth are in his hand. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hand formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Christ is the world's light, Christ and none other, born in our darkness, He became our brother. If we have seen Him, we have seen the Father, glory to God on high. God. 
God the Father, glory to God on Our first reading is from Proverbs chapter 9. Wisdom has built her house. She has set up its seven pillars. She has prepared her meat and mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her servants, and she calls from the highest point of the city. Let all who are simple come to my house. To those who have no sense, she says, come. Eat my food and drink the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and you will live. Walk in the way of insight. Whoever corrects a mocker invites insults. Whoever rebukes the wicked incurs abuse. Do not rebuke mockers or they will hate you. Rebuke the wise and they will love you. Instruct the wise and they will be wiser still. Teach the righteous, and they will add to their learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Our second reading is from 1 John chapter 3. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life. Because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or a sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Our final reading is from Luke chapter 14. One of those at table with him said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field. And I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. 
the servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you have ordered has been done, but there is still room. The master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Welcome to Puppet Time with Pastor. I'm here with my good friend, Barnabas. How are you doing, Barnabas? <laughs> you are doing great. Hey, this is a special day. I know that when people are watching this online, oh, it might be Sunday, maybe even Saturday, maybe even Monday. But, you know, you and I are talking on Friday, June 24th. And what is today? <laughs> National Take Your Dog to Work Day. Hey, I am so glad that you are joining me here at Beautiful Savior today. And I have to say, Barnabas, you really live up to your name. <laughs> what do I mean by that? That you live up to your name? Well, I gave you the name Barnabas. And Barnabas is a man that's mentioned in the Bible. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> What did he do? Well, Barnabas, he helped out the Apostle Paul. And Barnabas helped out a lot of other people. We're going to hear about that in a little bit in the message. But let me give you a sneak preview. <laughs> yep, I'm going to give you a sneak preview, but it does not mean that you cannot no longer pay attention to the sermon. <laughs> All right, I know you were just kidding. Well, Barnabas... That name means son of encouragement. And what he did was he had some property and he sold the property and he gave his money to the apostles. <laughs> yep, he gave the money to the apostles. <laughs> nope, the apostles didn't need a new car. They didn't even have cars back there. What are you talking about? Well, he gave the money to the apostles so they could distribute it to people in need. <laughs> <laughs> yep, you're right. People in need, like the box we have at Beautiful Savior, for people to give money to help people who might need some extra help, people who are in need. Well, Barnabas did this, and he's known as someone who is always just building people up, people who needed someone to kind of take them by the hand and remind them that everything's okay. <laughs> you're right. Everyone needs that because the world is filled with people who are really good with the critical eye. <laughs> What's the critical eye? It means looking at people and finding all the things that are wrong instead of the things that are right. <laughs> nope, I don't look at you with a critical eye. Do you look at me with a critical eye? <laughs> Only when the sermons get too long. Hey, that wasn't nice. <laughs> All right, I know you're goofing off. That's why I like having you here on National Take Your Pet to Work Day. Well, let's think about this. Barnabas was a really, really good encourager. And you're a good encourager, too. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Well, you have a way of always trying to make me feel good. And even if I think things aren't going well, you have a way of saying, that's okay, We'll go on with things tomorrow. You're a good encourager. I'm a good encourager too. What kind of things do I do for you? When you make mistakes, I don't give up on you. Well, that is true. And we kind of learn together, don't we? You know who is the best encourager of all time? Jesus. You're right, Jesus the very best encourager, he still encourages us through the word, his Holy Spirit, helping us to hear that word and hearing what Jesus says and says, you know, 
when Jesus says that about loving people, he's saying that to you, he's saying it to me. When Jesus talks about forgiving people, he's talking to you, he's talking to me. We have a God who doesn't want to throw us away, but he wants to keep us close to him. And how long does he want to keep us? For all eternity. Absolutely right. And you know, here's the thing. When we have people who encourage us and take care of us, just like Jesus does for you and me, do you know what we want to do? You're right. Encourage others. And maybe that's why God still has us here on this earth, isn't it? To help others out. Well, we heard a passage from 1 John chapter 3. It was a really cool passage. Dear children, let us not love with words or de- or speech, but with actions and in truth. What do you think that means? <laughs> right, if you're going to talk the talk, you need to walk the walk. We still say things. John's not saying don't say nice things. He's saying, yeah, we say things, but we have to back that up with our actions. So if we're going to tell people we love them, we are going to encourage them and not just say things like good job, but we're going to help people to do the best they can. And we're going to do it all because of love. Just like Jesus always encourages us, takes care of us in love. Well, after the hymn, we're going to hear a little bit more about this Barnabas. We're also going to hear about two people who didn't make good decisions, Ananias and Sapphira. But again, we're going to hear about this wondrous God who lives up to his name. You live up to your name, Barnabas. Son of encouragement. Yep, son of encouragement, puppy of encouragement. And we're going to hear about Jesus, who always lives up to his name, that beautiful name which means Savior. But before we do that, let's sing the next hymn. Some baseball players, way back when, the Montreal Expos, when Montreal had the team. So you see a father with his son. Now let me show you a picture of that little guy today. His little guy grew up to be this big guy. Who is it playing for the Toronto Blue Jays, who coincidentally are playing the Milwaukee Brewers this weekend? Well, that's Vladimir Guerrero Jr., Vladimir Guerrero Sr. was an outstanding ball player. Can you imagine being a junior, having to live up to that pressure? 
thinking about my dad was great. Oh, man, people are expecting the same thing out of me. Now, in Vladimir Guerrero Jr.'s case, he was able to live up to that. He's an outstanding player. But it is hard to live up to your name sometimes, isn't it? So, for instance, my name, Peter, means rock. And there are some times where I might find myself in a position where I can be kind of a steadying influence, calling people to not jump off the cliff, so to speak, but we're going to be okay. Let's trust in the Lord. But there are other times where I'm more like kind of squishy sand, and I don't do a good job of showing that complete faith and trust like I should. Well, we are going to hear a section as we continue our series going through the Acts of the Apostles that we're going to be introduced to three people, each with important names. Let's go to Acts chapter 4, beginning at verse 32, and then into chapter 5 through verse 11. We read in Acts 4, All the believers were united in heart and mind, And they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. For instance, there was Joseph the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. He sold the field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. But there was a certain man named Ananias who with his wife Sapphira sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles claiming it was the full amount With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit, and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell as you wished, and after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Then some men, some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet, and took him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, Was this the price you and your husband received for your land? Yes, she replied. That was the price. And Peter said, How can the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are just outside the door, and they will carry you out too. Instantly, she fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. Oh, I can imagine that great fear was filling the church at this point as far as thinking, man, God is serious here. God truly does see the heart and know what's going on. And God doesn't play games when it comes to people lying to him. Okay, so what is this lying thing? What was the issue? We have a contrast. First, we have Barnabas, son of encouragement. And what did Barnabas do? Like some others, he had some property. He sold it and gave all the proceeds to the church to help people in need. No one forced anyone to do this. This was simply done out of love. People loving their neighbor as themselves. Ananias and Sapphira... They also sold some property. No one forced them to do it, but how did they lie? Well, it kind of comes back to the motivation, doesn't it? What was in their heart? Their motivation was wanting everyone to think, look at how great we are. 
we're giving everything to. When in fact they weren't, they were really kind of worried about outward impressions, but their heart wasn't in it. They didn't live up to their name. Here's what I mean. You see, Barnabas again means son of encouragement. Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias means God is gracious. Well, God is gracious, but Ananias wasn't necessarily gracious. And he found out with the consequences that God also is a just judge. And then there's Sapphira, which simply means beautiful, but she might have looked like she was doing a beautiful thing on the outside, but inside the heart was all filled with self-centeredness. They didn't live up to their names. Now, listen carefully to Revelation verse 20, chapter 21, verse 8. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. You know, for you and me, it's important to realize that there are some things that if we start going there, it's definitely a danger zone. This is why in our first reading from Proverbs 9 today, we heard about this call for, to wisdom. God wants to give us wisdom so we can hear his word and understand what he wants us to do in certain situations. But I want you to consider this quote by Pastor Chuck Swindoll. Life on earth, is really nothing more than a string of moments. And I don't want my testimony for Jesus Christ to be shattered by a single moment of indulging my flesh. I don't want one moment of rage or pride or lust to cast a shadow over a lifetime of walking with my Lord. Frankly, I fear that possibility. And you know what? I want to fear that possibility. When I stop fearing it, I'm in grave danger. In other words, why is he so concerned about how he's living and making sure that he doesn't fall into temptation? Well, isn't that how Jesus teaches us to pray? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In other words, keep us from going into that danger zone. You see, Ananias and Sapphira give us a stark example of consequences for walking away from the Lord in our self-centeredness. Take a moment, won't you, to think about, is there any danger zone you're very close to at this point in life? Maybe you found yourself in an area where it seems to be controlling you, even though you know that it's displeasing to the Lord. What do you do about it? Especially when you consider Ananias and Sapphira and what happened to them. Do you fear that? Do you fear that a just God has every right to bring punishment? Think about it. Have you ever done this? You see this picture where you have boxes, pack stuff away, toss it out, or keep it, or give it away. You see, there are some things in our life, aren't there, that we have to take an inventory of, and in some cases toss, get rid of completely, because they're not healthy for us. They are driving us away from the Lord instead of closer to him. But there are the things we need to keep, to hold on to, because they're beneficial for us. But I have this question for you. What does God do with me? when I fail to live up to the name he has given me, because we've been given that name, haven't we? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And I have to say that there are times where I fail. This is why when we confess our sins, I can say I'm right there. Now let me take a moment just to say that there is some great importance, benefit, from confessing your sins. And sometimes that confession is best done 
if you come to me as your pastor or another pastor, not because we as pastors love taking notes on people and say, oh, you're kidding me, but because we as pastors love to give you this good news, this good news that God does not toss you away, throw you out, but God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins. Think about that. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us, as we read in 1 John. But if we confess our sin, if we're truly sorry for that, coming clean before God, what does God do? He's faithful and he is just. He's going to do the just thing, and his justice points us to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of our sins. You see, there is one person who perfectly lives up to his name, and that's Jesus. The name Jesus means Savior. The Lord Jesus came to save sinners, as Paul would say, so I say of myself, of whom I'm the worst. Jesus comes not to toss us away, but to hold us close to him, forgiving our sins so we can live now as the forgiven, redeemed children of God. This is why he died, didn't he? As the Lamb of God to cover the guilt of sin, to take the punishment we deserved. We should drop dead in our sin, but instead of dropping dead eternally, Jesus forgives us to give us life just as he rose victorious on Easter. So we too will have this marvelous day, even though we'll die, yet physically, yet we'll live. We'll be raised to life to celebrate in that eternal feast. Now, think about it. We heard from Proverbs 9. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. You know, Ananias and Sapphira, their biggest problem was lack of fear, reverence for the Lord and what he wanted, and maybe not understanding him, not only in his holiness, but that he is this God of love, but this God who also sees and knows all things and who can judge the heart. You can't pull one over on God. They tried. Here's an interesting quote from the 19th century pastor George MacDonald. Half of the misery in the world comes from trying to look instead of trying to be what one is not. In other words, we can be really good at being actors and actresses, putting up a facade so people think we are one way. All the time we're something else. And instead of really asking God to work in us and say, what do you want me to be? Work in me, conform me to be more and more like you. We call that the work of sanctification, making us more and more holy. The Holy Spirit does that through word and sacrament. Instead of letting God do that in us, we just try to be actors and actresses so everyone sees us and thinks, oh, you're, you're really doing well there. Just like Ananias and Sapphira wanted people to think about them, but they were just play acting. Their heart wasn't there. But I want to add something to that. Half of the mystery of the world comes from trying to look instead of trying to be what one is not. How about this? Or expecting another to live up to impossible standards which you cannot fulfill yourself. Ever guilty of that? Of having the critical eye? It's always easier, isn't it? To find what's wrong rather than what's right. We do it for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's to build ourselves up when we can see others doing something worse than we would. Sometimes it's because our standards for other people are just ridiculously high expecting perfection. Maybe it's because we were never treated as one to be built up rather than torn down. Now, I want you to think about this example. You see this picture here of a lawnmower? It's a battery-operated one in Eagle. I have a lawnmower just like this. In fact, I love cutting the lawn. 
It's relaxing to me. And I have to admit that this is the first year where my son Isaac has really kind of taken over the grass cutting. He wanted to go out there, help me out. He likes getting a tan. And so I let him do it. And I'm glad he's doing it. But I have to admit that as a parent over the years, I've had the critical eye. And I never really even realized what I was doing. What I mean by that is if I want things done a certain way, and my child is so excited about helping out and does something for me, and I let the child do it, I might look at that and say, oh, yeah, that was really nice, thank you. But then I redo things. Well, what am I saying to the child? Your way wasn't good enough. And instead of building up, well, I really like the words of St. Paul in Ephesians 6, but I especially like the way Eugene Peterson paraphrased it in the message. Here's what we read. Fathers, don't exasperate your children by coming down hard on them. Take them by the hand and lead them in the way of the master. You know what it means to exasperate, to frustrate, to make someone feel that I'm never going to do it well enough. I'm trying, I'm really trying, but it's never going to be good enough. The evil one tries to give us a picture of God that makes us exasperated by this God who gives us unrealistic standards. We can't live up to it. Can't figure it all out and do it all. But that's not the picture God gives. You know what picture God gives? It's kind of like Barnabas, the son of encouragement. This is the picture we have of God. To use the analogy here, we have a God who lets us, his kids, cut the lawn. Even though we might not have every row perfectly straight, even though we might miss things and make mistakes here and there, he lets us cut the lawn. He lets us go into this world to do what he's gifted us to do. And what has he gifted us to do more than anything else through his spirit? To live up to the name like Barnabas did. Son of encouragement. Son or daughter of encouragement. This is what we are to be. People who build up rather than tear down. Now listen carefully. That doesn't mean that you just look and say, oh, you can do whatever you want. No, that's not how God is. God has truth. God has standards. But God is also a God of love. And instead of looking for reasons to tear us down and toss us out, he encourages us, doesn't he? He builds us up. When we come to him, when we are truly repentant, what does he do? He forgives us in Jesus. He gives us a brand new day and says, now let's walk together. And you know what that means when we're in this world, when we're cutting the lawn? Well, what we do, how we take care of this world, if you will, is to share that kind of empathetic love with others around us. So what does that mean? Empathetic love. You see, what empathy is is not just saying, oh, I'm going to put myself in your shoes and try to put myself in your position, trying to see how you might be feeling about something. That's a really good thing. But you know what? Maybe what I'm feeling as far as how I would feel in a particular situation might be totally different than how you're actually feeling. And so part of empathy is sitting down and actually learning a person's story and hearing what it is that is hurting the person. And then you know what we do. Now we have the opportunity to share Jesus. You see, one of the things that happens, not to everyone, but to some people, is there are so many people in their life that are always there with a critical eye, cutting them down, that they have a really hard time feeling built up, encouraged. 
And so they always kind of think they're failures. And then the evil one gets in there. And he makes it even worse because he has a way of bringing back in their memories and sometimes exaggerating in their memories all the ways they failed. All the things they've done which they know are wrong in God's sight. How could you do that? Really? But you know what happens when God has us out there cutting the lawn? We get to talk about this loving Father who lets us do things. And when we fail and when we mistake, make mistakes, He doesn't stop us in the sense that, well, that's it, no more life with me, you're not going to be able to do that anymore. No, he forgives, he builds up through his spirit, says it's a new day because I want to be with you. This is the God I know. This is the God I love. It's like a wonderful parent who knows how to give kids the opportunity to learn responsibility, the opportunity to even maybe fail, but to do so in a setting where you are still loved. And you can keep going. You can keep cutting the lawn, even though it might not be up to God's perfect standards, because we're sinners, yet he still lets us go through life with him. He encourages us through his spirit, through the word, saying, well, here's how you do it. You you did it this way, but, but here's how you do it. Now let's do it again. Let's try again. Keep going. You see, this is the God we get to share with people when we learn their stories. And we can say, no, I can relate. I'm a sinner too. That whole idea about God hates sin but loves the sinner, I understand that because I'm a sinner who's screwed up terribly. But what a wondrous God who forgives, who loves. What a wondrous God who doesn't toss me out. You know, Barnabas son of encouragement, as we go through the Acts of the Apostles, we're going to hear about him again. And he's going to be the one who brings Saul, whom we'll know as Paul, to the believers and encourages them to receive him with great joy because of how the Lord Jesus appeared to him and changed everything for him. You know, we have the opportunity as we share Jesus with people around us, to say, here's who our God is. Does our God have perfect standards? Does he take sin seriously? Does he look at the heart and does not like hypocrisy? Yeah, we see that in Ananias and Sapphira, who didn't live up to their names. But you see, he doesn't want to toss us out, does he? He loves to encourage, like Barnabas. He loves to make us sons and daughters of the perfect encourager who look at people not as things, objects, to get rid of, but as people dearly loved. So much so by God that he would send his son who lived up to his name, Jesus, so that in him there might be forgiveness of sins and eternal life. The marvelous passage again from 1 John 3 Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. What about your actions? You living in truth? The truth of being this child of God who is the encourager, the forgiver, the lover of you? Is that what you're sharing, acting out in your life? We pray that God, the Holy Spirit, would work in us. So we live up to our name in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and live in his love. Presence and take.
Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free Spirit. Holy God, holy and most gracious Father, have mercy and hear us. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Lord, keep this nation under your care, and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. For the needy shall not always be forgotten, and the hope of the poor shall not perish forever. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless us, defend us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. I want to thank you so very, very much for joining us for worship this day. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. God be with you. Have an excellent rest of the day.